Donald Trump doing what he does best, trying to delay justice by claiming, wait for it, presidential immunity yet again. Today, Trump's legal team filing a motion to delay his New York criminal hush money trial, which is currently set to begin March 25th, just two weeks away. Trump argues the trial should wait for the United States Supreme Court to weigh in on his presidential immunity claim. Those arguments are scheduled for April 25th. Trump's legal team writing, quote, the court must preclude the people from offering evidence at trial of President Trump's official acts as the commander in chief. Trump claiming that even though Stormy Daniels was paid off in the fall of 2016, Trump didn't reimburse his then personal fixer and attorney Michael Cohen until 2017 when he was president. And thus, all of those actions are going to fall under the category of, quote, official acts. Trump's attorneys also arguing that Trump made statements about it as president and on official premises, referencing this infamous moment aboard Air Force One in 2018. His team adding, quote, President Trump respectfully submits that an adjournment of the trial is appropriate to await further guidance from the Supreme Court. Trump has other legal problems of his own making waves today as well. Trump posting a $91 million bond in the civil defamation case of E. Jean Carroll as he tries to appeal that ruling. And despite that legal trouble and hefty payments, Trump is continuing to make statements that could land him back in court. 91 million on a fake story, totally made up story. False accusations made about me by a woman that I knew nothing about, didn't know, never heard of. Ms. Bergdorf Goodman, a person I never, I never met, I have no idea who she is. I was given a false accusation and had to post a $91 million bond on a false accusation. E. Jean Carroll's lawyer saying they could possibly sue again, stating, quote, we continue to monitor every statement that Donald Trump makes about our client. And in the interest of full disclosure, I am friends with E. Jean Carroll. Joining me now is Renato Mariotti, former federal prosecutor for the Northern District of Illinois, and Christy Greenberg, former criminal division chief for the Southern District of New York. My thanks to both of you for getting us started this evening. Christy, I'd like to start with you. I want your reaction to the filing. Specifically, let's look at the one that's in the New York case. Trump's attempts to delay to adjourn this trial from beginning. You know, before the show started, I looked at really carefully the arguments that he's raising and put aside whether or not those that conduct as alleged Christie actually falls within the official kind of parameters or the perimeters of his official conduct. I had a concern about the fact that Trump is now citing to the Anderson case, which is that recent decision from Colorado, and also citing to the fact that SCOTUS decided to take up that presidential immunity defense in the first place. Do you think that actually gives Judge Juan Marchand some cause for pause now? Well, those cases are interesting that he mentioned, but what's what's even more interesting is the case that they didn't mention, which was the case that was before Judge Hellerstein in this very matter, where they sought, Trump's lawyers sought to remove this case to federal court. And this very issue was put before Judge Hellerstein, and Judge Hellerstein said, Trump is not immune from the people of New York's prosecution in New York Supreme Court. This argument of immunity is not a colorable defense. And he specifically went through the these same duties that they are trying to, uh, you know, put forth now and said these are not presidential duties, hiring and making payments to your personal attorney to handle personal affairs, not a presidential duty, reimbursing Cohen for advancing the hush money, not a presidential duty. That is law of the case. And they had the opportunity to appeal that to the Second Circuit. They did not do so. They had the opportunity even to bring it up in a motion to dismiss. They didn't do so. They didn't even bring it up in the time frame that they were supposed to for a motion in limine, which is just trying to exclude certain evidence from trial. This is not only been there, done that, they've already been ruled on. 
in the federal court in the same case, but it's also untimely. So yes, I understand that there are matters going on before SCOTUS, but they they have already been adjudicated in this case, just as they were, by the way, with E. Jean Carroll. E. Jean Carroll in that trial, they also made, did not make the argument, and therefore the district court in that case said, hey, you didn't make it in a timely way in the first three years of the case. You don't get to make it now. So just as it was waived there, I assume it will be waived here and the trial will proceed. Yeah, and Renata, to Christie's point, Trump actually did appeal that decision from Hellerstein, but then he voluntarily dismissed that appeal, thereby actually not having the Second Circuit make a decision. But Renato, does it make a difference, though, that that decision was done by a judge to basically say you've you've argued for immunity, you don't get it, Trump, but the fact that the Supreme Court is actually going to be deciding it, does that end up actually maybe overruling in any way what a prior judge has already decided? I don't think so. So the, what the Supreme Court is deciding is to, the, to what extent there is presidential immunity. That is sort of a standalone question. The issue here, and I agree 100 percent with what Christie just said, is whether or not there's collateral estoppel because he there was a finding by a judge that he had waived the absolute immunity argument, and then he didn't appeal that. Uh, ultimately, he withdrew his appeal. So I, I think that that issue in this particular case is decided. Now, could that impact the January 6th case or a different case? Perhaps. But it doesn't impact this case because ultimately he had the opportunity to make that argument. He did not make that argument. He waived it. And then ultimately he could have appealed. He ultimately withdrew that appeal, didn't go forward. And that, I think, disposes of that issue here. Uh, and that's obviously why he recognizes that's an issue. That's why he's trying to save it here at the last minute. I also agree with Christy, too little, too late. Yeah. And, you know, Christy, within this motion, there's also some inconsistent positions that are taken by Trump that I think somebody like Judge Mershan is going to pick up on. For example, he's trying to say that certain conduct like his tweets that he did that are at issue in this case, tweets that dealt with Michael Cohen and others, that those actually were in his official capacity. That's what Trump's asserting in this particular motion to adjourn the trial. But on previous occasions, Trump took an inconsistent position where he said, actually, those are personal capacity tweets that are being made, so you cannot actually use them against him. Does that require, then, some type of hearing by Judge Mershan to decide this in terms of whether he wants to adjourn the trial, or is that just something that can be dealt with as the trial actually commences? I think the judge will look to deal with it before the trial starts. Um, I, I think, you know, yes, they're, it, they take positions whenever they think it is useful to them, and, and they don't always have to be consistent. Uh, it's it's certainly the case that these tweets that he was making, I mean, those are, you know, statements of, of the defendant in the criminal case. And again, they're dealing with personal matters about his personal lawyer. So, you know, I, I do expect that the judge will have a ruling on this, because really what they're trying to do is they're trying to take their immunity defense, which again, they've already waived. It's too late and it's already been dealt with. And they're trying to shoehorn it into a different issue, which is what kind of evidence can be admissible in the trial. And once you've said as a matter of law that they can't make the immunity defense, I don't then see how the judge is going to keep out certain evidence that on that same basis. So again, I, I think there is this tortured, a tortured argument from the Trump team to try and get at, at a minimum some evidence thrown out. But these are the defendant's own statements. These are Donald Trump's own statements. I don't think this immunity defense at the, this late hour is going to save him. And Renato, another Hail Mary that Donald Trump is trying to do is he's trying to buy some more time in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. Not so egregious. He wants 10 more days, which is more time than the federal rules of criminal procedure allow. But to the gamesmanship that comes from Trump legal in terms of his defense, they, as in the Trump legal team, is saying, well, you know, Judge Cannon, Trump needs more time because he's going to go to trial in New York on March 25th. But in the same breath and out of the same mouth, they're now saying, well, you know what, we want to adjourn that case. Renato, how much coordination or paying attention is going on between Judge Mershan in New York and Judge Cannon in uh, Florida? I mean, I know special counsel has filed its opposition to that motion for more time in the classified documents case. Great question. I mean, the judges uh, are not monitoring each other's dockets. 
but you can be sure that the prosecutors of both cases are watching all of those other cases. Pretty extensive team uh, working with uh, uh, District Attorney Bragg, for example. Obviously, the special counsel has a substantial team. They're going to put that in front of the judge. You can absolutely bet your bottom dollar that these positions are going to get thrown in front of the other judge, and it makes them look bad. I think all, one of the issues with trying to delay every case is that ultimately it just makes you look bad in front of all the judges. It's much easier to delay all but one or to try to push them in a certain order. Uh, but, you know, candidly, they did not try to delay this one early enough or, or enough. I really think that the Trump team missed opportunities to delay in the Manhattan DA's case. Maybe they, at the time, were less worried about it, and now they realize that they put themselves in a position where they've got a trial coming up, and it's a more difficult case than they really uh, gave it credit for. New details on Trump's $90 million bond are raising alarms. That big bond being posted at the 11th hour last week in the E. Jean Carroll case, giving Trump time to appeal that defamation verdict before he has to pay up. Trump's bond was underwritten by a branch of the company Chubb, one of the largest insurance firms in the world, and one that has a history with Trump. In 2018, Trump appointed Chubb's CEO, Evan Greenberg, to a White House Advisory Council on Trade Policy. Then in 2020, Greenberg served on a council of business leaders advising Trump on how to reopen the economy after the COVID pandemic. My next guest is on the president's task force to reopen the economy, and he was on that call yesterday. He is Chubb Chairman and CEO Evan Greenberg. The more we can have the ability to, to test, identify, isolate um, while we practice social distancing. And, you know, we weren't telling the president anything that he doesn't already know. All of this raising speculation that Trump may have called in a favor to secure that bond. Chubb also has provided Trump with insurance policies in the past, which came under scrutiny in his New York civil fraud case. New York Attorney General Letitia James alleging that in 2010, quote, Chubb sent an insurance appraiser to determine the worth of Trump's triplex penthouse apartment at Trump Tower. But Trump rushed the expert out before the assessor could take any measurements. Also of note, the terms of the bond agreement between Trump and Chubb have not been disclosed to the public. We don't know what assets Trump may have had to put up to secure that bond, or more importantly, if the bond was co-signed by someone else. Former FBI counsel Andrew Weissman making this very point on The Beat on Friday. And the issue is, is he going to be beholden to somebody? We already know that somehow he got a bond from Chubb. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in knowing, did somebody, for instance, have to co-sign? Um, was there somebody there, some individual there who he's um, beholden to? Joining me now is Neil Peterson, the owner of the New York-based surety bond agency, Peterson and & Sons. And Christy Greenberg has stayed and is back with us. Christy, I wanted to start with you because from a legal standpoint, um, in criminal cases, for example, there's something called a Nebbia requirement, right? So if it's a case that involves drugs or maybe money laundering, et cetera, sometimes there is a requirement for a criminal defendant to have to show that the bond proceeds came from clean money, right? But we don't have that in this instance in a civil case. We don't have that for purposes of an appellate surety bond. So how concerned should anyone be, including the court perhaps, as to whether or not um, the terms of this bond need to be be kind of transparent for everyone to know about? Well, I think you know, one thing I thought was interesting was today was the day when E. Jean Carroll's lawyers could have objected to the bond. They did not do so. Uh, and the court you know, ha has to still approve the bond. But um, usually there's not a lot of looking behind and trying to get transparency from the court. You know, the, if you can get a bond from a reputable insurance company, then usually that's really the end of the inquiry. And at least for E. Jean Carroll, knowing that there is security there and that she's going to get paid if, if, she, if as I suspect, she would be successful in her appeal is really the end of the inquiry. But for us, obviously, as, as the public and with this individual being a candidate for president, it raises all kinds of questions. Um, so 
So yes, you would love to know that there's going to be transparency. I just don't know that we'll get it from the courts here. There is one person who may have some insight into it, and that may be the independent monitor, Judge Jones. Remember, any time now under this new decision from uh, Judge Ngoron in the civil fraud case, any financial disclosures that need to be made to a third party, uh, including lenders like Chubb, need to be need prior approval from the independent monitor, need to be reviewed and approved before uh, before they can go out. So she may have some insight as to what kind of doc, you know, who it is, who the lenders are, if there are any, um, and, you know, what that what that looks like. So she may have some insight, but I don't know that that will ever trickle down to the public. Neil, put your bond hat on for us and kind of walk us through, A, whether or not there's much ado about nothing when it comes to this bond, and B, how much would somebody like Donald Trump have to put up to be able to get this bond in the first place, and what kind of collateral would you be looking for for the balance of that judgment? So in my, in my uh, professional opinion, I believe he had to put up liquid collateral. A lot of different newspapers and other organizations are talking about uh, using real estate as collateral. It's not traditionally done with a matter of this size. It's generally the surety has 10 days to pay the judgment. I believe in the bond that was filed, it has some sort of 30-day clause. 30 days is not sufficient time to liquidate real estate and, you know, satisfy a judgment. If you had to liquidate real estate in 30 days, it would be at a fire sale and the price would be impossible to determine. Uh, separately, there's other issues. If uh, former President Donald Trump is reelected. Can you perfect the indemnity agreement, which is the contract uh, surety companies use to secure the bond against the sitting U.S. president? So that's one of the concerns. Surety companies are not very forward thinking and they're very risk averse. So it's not it's not like someone's going to come in here and extend a lot of credit. And the asset base you would want for a client with a matter of this size to extend them credit would be several times what it's reported that uh, former President Donald Trump is worth. So be looking for somebody worth 17 to 20 billion to really get them a lot of credit. So Neil, I want to stick with you for a second then. A assuming when you say liquid assets, you're talking cash, right? Because that's cash is king. If Donald Trump doesn't have the ability to be able to give a reassurance to a bond surety that he has that uh, you know value, um, to be able to satisfy making sure that that surety company gets what it's putting its own money up for at this point, would you then require somebody to co-sign on that bond? That's always an option. I have a lot of clients that have an additional guarantor or what we call as indemnitors. There's various matters where maybe you have uh, one party that needs to obtain a bond and maybe another company is going to acquire that company. So they may have a vested interest in getting them a bond or Another, there could be other reasons, such as, you know, someone has a vested interest in, in a person getting a bond and they could step up and guarantee it. So, yes, that's a possibility. And, and you know, Christy, Neil brings up a really important issue, which is you get somebody like Trump, he ends up back in the Oval for whatever reason, can't get him to maybe honor his obligations contractually that he has to do to federal insurance, which is the surety in this case for aging Carroll. So what do you have to do if you can't sue a sitting president or even pr really, you know, pursue anything civilly because he's a sitting president? Does the federal slash Chubb just have to wait until he gets out of the Oval to be able to collect on any of this? Right. I mean, that that to me is the real conundrum for any insurance company, for any potential bond company that would be looking to secure bond here is that if he does become president and he stiffs them, you know, the, the recourse uh, is not going to may not come and may not come for a while. So it, it's a real risk uh, to to do. And I'm, I'm really especially with someone, again, who is who's been found liable for committing financial fraud and in particular, insurance fraud. So uh, so this seems like a real risk to me. Um, again, it seems as though he had a personal relationship with the CEO of, of Chubb, and maybe that came into it. I mean, it raises a lot of questions about, about who would feel comfortable providing a bond, posting a bond for him in, in this kind of circumstance.